Welcome back to Highly Respected. I'm your host, Scott Greer, and today we're going to have, of course, another incredible episode for you guys, so hopefully you enjoy it. And we've got a lot of Cognitive Elite questions this week. I sent out an e- a reminder to these guys, like, hey, you can ask as many questions as you want, and the people responded with a ton of questions. So we're going to have a lot of questions at the end of this episode, so be on the lookout for that. But we've got some topics to discuss before then. So the first topic we're going to discuss is the Constitution. Uh, The media and even some conservatives, well, actually, many conservatives are up in arms because they said that, or they claim that Trump said we need to terminate the Constitution to reinstate Trump as president. Uh, Trump said this on Truth Social in response to the Twittergate uh, files that were being dropped by Elon Musk and Matt Taibbi about the collusion between Twitter media outlets and uh, the Biden campaign and even federal government officials to hide the Hunter Biden story. This is pretty interesting. Um, I'm not really going to cover it that much because I think, you know, this has been well covered by most mainstream conservative outlets. I think it reveals a lot of what we already knew. It's it's pretty interesting and it shows how, you know, just like the Biden campaign being like, hey, take this down. Like, sure. Do you want are in this like total collusion that was going on? And it definitely had an impact on the election. And liberals want to spin it as saying that all this is is just uh, conservatives wanting to see more Hunter Biden dick pics. And that was all the censorship is that they're just trying to censor Hunter's uh, dick pics, which this is going back on a new theory because you have to remember when they hid this initial stuff, it wasn't about like, you know, hiding revenge porn which is now the new argument it was claiming that this is russian disinformation totally fake uh you know manipulated information totally not real not based on anything and this is why we need to hide it which it turned out to be not the case that was all lies it was actually real information and they try to use this hunter biden dick pic because unfortunately conservatives were showing like all these pictures of like hunter biden with like prostitutes and women and doing bizarre shit and you know there was real like stuff there there was real meat there about corruption with burisma with chinese corporations and a lot of other things and there was a connection to joe biden and uh, but it did get sidetracked by uh hunter's dick pics which there were some hilarious memes at the time in 2020 there was one where it's uh uh guo is this chinese uh billionaire is like was somewhat financing um the release of some of these pics and he's like we're releasing even more hunter biden dick pics and there's like all these uh maga soy jacks they're like base let's go there's even one where it's like a soy jack and it's like oh check out this hunter biden dick pic and he's got like his phone up there's a lot of great memes you gotta uh i don't know you should look them up but maybe not on google uh because i don't recommend uh Typing into Google Hunter Biden dick pic Trump uh, soy jack. I don't know if that's something you want in your browser history, but uh, you know, to each their own. Uh, so it, there is a legitimate story there besides the uh, the goofy aspects of it. And I think it did have an impact in the election. I think if more people were aware of Hunter Biden's corruption and the connections with Joe Biden, that would have swayed enough votes to ensure that Trump was uh, the was the winner. Uh, I think that would have that there were several other things. I mean, the media really media and social media, both, you know, like CNN and Twitter and Facebook, they all colluded to hide information and to ensure that Biden became the president. And so understandably, Trump is a little upset about this. So Trump uh, released a (laughs) hilarious uh, true social um, uh, post. I was about to call a tweet and even retruthed it. (laughs) It's like, according to the screenshot I'm reading off of. So Trump said, So with the revelation of massive and widespread fraud and deception in working closely with big tech companies, the DNC and the Democratic Party, do you throw the presidential election results of 2020 out and declare the rightful winner? Or do you have a new election? I've been going back and forth between Trump impression and normal voice. I guess I will go... Um, back to just normal voice. A massive fraud of this type in Mattitude allows for the termination of all rules, regulations, and articles, even those found in the Constitution. Our great founders, for some reason that's in quotes, uh, did not want and would not condone 
false and fraudulent election. So yeah, we had a bit of a mix of Trump impression. You guys can criticize me in the comments if you want, but I'm not gonna let those comments get to me. Uh, so it's like the it's like the standard Trump statement. Like he's been saying this stuff for two years. Um, I didn't really, you know, he's been calling to be reinstated president a bunch of different times. It's just what Trump says. But for whatever reason, this one comment really um, irritate or aggravated people. So there's all these articles you can go into the New York Times saying Trump calls for the termination of the Constitution, which he, it's not really even saying, you know, he's saying even those found in the Constitution. It's like a vague, like, Trump statement. And it's like something you probably shouldn't take seriously. Like, I don't think... As there was some person uh, I was talking with who was like, what does this mean? Do, does there something go from here? And I was like, I don't think there's anything in the Constitution that says that you have to reinstate a president due to a truth social post. Uh, so it's, you know, it's just standard, you know, Trump bluster. I find it funny, uh, but I don't take it that seriously. But it, there is a serious discussion over how the right approaches the Constitution that I think is worth discussing. And that's what that's what Highly Respected is going to talk about today, one of the topics. And there's been a lot of debate over the Constitution in this. And one thing I want to get into before then is how the left, you know, will suddenly love the Constitution at one point when they'll go back and say, we need to abolish it. And then the other, like, we're the true upholders of the Constitution. And they do this a lot with... Um, you know, challenging the election results or challenging their power or criticizing the FBI and CIA. You know, <laughs> apparently the FBI and CIA are, are, are were embedded in the Constitution from the beginning. Um, you know, they'll so so anytime that there's if if it's an argument that they can use to solidify their power or, or make their points better, they'll be like, oh, we got to defend the Constitution They're They're a threat to the Constitution. And so. They even did this with like Trump and like him questioning the election results and and other things that conservatives want to do is like this is challenging our constitutional order. But they, unlike conservatives, they typically go with threats to democracy rather than threats to constitution. Threats to constitution still is primarily a conservative libertarian thing. When Democrats go to that rhetoric, they go to threats to democracy rather than threats to the constitution. Conservatives, like one of the dumbest conservative takes is like, we are not a democracy. We are a republic. And it's like, uh, you know, <laughs> this technically, yes. But, you know, people use democracy to mean America and they've used it for a long time. So it doesn't. And it's like, what is that supposed to mean? They always love this. Like we are a republic, not a democracy. It's like, OK, we still use, you know, in a lot of people's minds, those are synonyms. Uh, you know, there are differences, but uh, even the people who say that can't really articulate the differences. It's just like, uh, you know, a catchphrase that means nothing. So they so they're big into that. But with Democrats, they really do try to emphasize democracy more than constitutional order or the Constitution. They'll bring up the Constitution to, you know, and reinterpret it to mean it is a radical egalitarian document that supports modern liberalism, modern progressivism, that that's what the Constitution is about, is that you've the civil rights order is found in there. Uh, you know, trans rights is found in the Constitution. You know, they'll make all those claims. But at the end of the day, they're not really that committed to the Constitution. You know, they cha they finally changed the Constitution after World War II. Uh, they changed it even with a new deal. So they've never, you know, they've and they've wanted to change it even more. You know, they wanted to, uh, you know, have more amendments, you know, totally and totally overlook what the Constitution says. They even overlook what the Constitution spells out for the duties for the president because, you know, they they think the president could just do whatever he wants except for enforce immigration law. You know, we have apparently a part of the constitutional order, according to Democrats, is not enforcing immigration law whatsoever, which, you know, one of the uh, points of duties of the president is to uphold the law of the country and um, clearly democrats don't want to do that at least when it comes to immigration or even when it comes to crime so they don't really care that much about the constitution it's just a you know it's just something that they'll use to browbeat republicans like oh you say you like the constitution yet your your guy is saying that we should terminate the constitution which is not what trump was really saying and it's just a kind of standard trumpian statement that's uh, somewhat humorous a little bit 
We'll say it's a little over the top, a little uh, exaggerated. I don't think it's going to mean anything, but, you know, people are taking it seriously. But going back to the point of how the right views the Constitution and how we should view the Constitution, our, you know, nationalist, dissident, right, whatever term you want to say. So there's been a long debate over this. For most of the time, for American conservatives have been seen as the true upholders, defenders of the Constitution, and that they've always appealed to the Constitution Going way back, even even before the conservative movement was formally, you know, uh, crystallized after World War II, you know, even to the 30s and before that into the 19th century, you know, there was always these appeals about the Constitution and how, you know, we're defending the proper constitutional order. And as it's stated by the founders, that this is a, an important factor in right wing thinking in America since the founding, since our not since the founding, since the Constitution was created. And despite all the criticisms the right may lobby at the Constitution, you know, it's provided a pretty effective framework for America to have a, you know, functioning system. You know, we did have some violence. Uh, you know, we did have the Civil War uh, where we actually after the Civil War, we had a new understanding of the Constitution and the way our country worked. But for a hundred and almost 160 years, you know, we've had a pretty functioning system. You know, most countries uh, comparatively speaking, have not been as stable as us and as prosperous as us. And some of this is, a, and a lot of this is due in part to our commitment to the Constitution. But a part of the reason why our country succeeded is that the type of people here who created the Constitution and fostered it and were committed to it were the type of people to uphold that society that was imagined in the Constitution. You know, you can't transfer the Constitution to other countries. Uh, and this, and hope that they turn into America. Liberia has pretty much the exact same constitution as us. Liberia is nowhere, is not America. Liberia is one of the shittiest countries in the world. It's been that way for many, many years. So, you know, when you have a different people running it, uh, you don't have the type of ideal constitutional order as envisioned by the founding fathers or that we've had in America. And even with all the problems that America has, we're not Liberia. <laughs> We're not Haiti. So we, we at least have that up for, that going for us. So that's something to keep in mind uh, with that. And many of the principles found within the Constitution or other founding documents are good. Equality before the law, I think that's good. And that was done mainly uh, as a re reaction to what Europe was doing, where it had... Uh, different tiers of law where, you know, the nobles were treated entirely different and could get away with whatever they wanted. And they, you know, didn't even have to pay taxes in this stuff. You know, America, everyone's equal under law. You know, you're you're susceptible to the same laws no matter what class you come from. I think most people, uh, some people may not like that concept, but it's function. It's worked pretty well for us. Uh, one of the problems is that we're no longer acknowledging equality under the law is that some people, uh, depending on their color of their skin, are able to skirt away from the rule of law and are able to get a supremacy before the law just because of their race. And it's not white people we're talking about. It's a certain uh, magical group of people that we're talking about. Whites know are... <laughs> maybe a little bit unequal before the law it is that they're more susceptible to crimes and punishment than others are more susceptible to punishment under the law than other other groups of people a strong defense of property rights that's good i think most people should agree with that and even just the type of system that we had you know are primarily establishing a rule of law rule of law is uh, good i think we if you have a lawless system uh, there's a lot of problems with that is that people can just come and steal your property or and murder you, you know, without just for any whim or reason. You know, you want to have an established rule of law. You want to know what type of rule laws you're violating, which to follow. I think a big problem, even like something uh, you can see this concept applied to somewhere like Twitter, where before or in social media before you could just get banned for no reason at all. And there's no way to... Uh, you know, appeal it. There's no rhyme or reason for you being banned. It's just at the arbitrary, capri <laughs> arbitrary whim of somebody of some, you know, low level social media staffer that about the bans you. That's different from American law, which, you know, why you're arrested is for a reason you're put on trial, you're able to defend yourself, you're able to, you know, articulate your case, you're able to know why you've been arrested, what crime you're charged with. 
Uh, just imagine that the type of lack of rule of law that guided social media censorship, censorship then guided the rest of the country. You know, you just arrested and punish for no reason at all just because some low-level official decided that you're a threat or they didn't like you. And that could, that's the type of system you can imagine without the rule of law. So there's a lot of good things to constitute. And also, uh, you know, right to bear arms, freedom of speech, uh, freedom of religion. I think there's a lot of great things found in the Constitution. So I'm not as... Uh, anti-constitution as other people you know some people are like oh liberalism enlightenment you know these uh people think we can restore uh you know an 18th century monarchy in, in america uh absolutist monarchy I, I don't think that's uh, likely to happen so for what it is you know maybe it might not be the perfect system maybe not maybe not be ideal for what we want but it works and i think you have to realize the left wants to overturn it and abolish it and just trouted out whenever they need to make an argument to embarrass conservatives they don't really honor it or acknowledge it and we don't really have a better effective defense against some of the left's depredations uh than the constitution you got to think about this without the constitution we wouldn't have freedom of speech we wouldn't have the right to bear arms we wouldn't have a lot of all these all these things and actually by appealing it to it keeps the left's tyrannies in check so I don't believe throwing it out is the best measure. But a lot of people believe throwing it out because they can just we can create whatever constitution we want. And and if we abandon the constitution, then we will effectively challenge the left, which I'm not I'm a, I'm a bit skeptical about that. And even at times, you know, back in my earlier radical years, um, I was writing for a certain publication that uh, got me in trouble. Uh, of course, I'm referring to the Daily Call. <laughs> of course it's the daily caller uh, some people may uh, get that joke but back to the constitution i think it's still an effective tool for the right it's still uh, honored by people that we try to reach people uh, positively associate the constitution only the people who negatively associate the constitution are most of the far left and some of the far right just some of the far right it's a minority and it's uh Generally, people who maybe adopted a little bit too much of a niche uh, internet ideology, maybe like Neo Reaction or something like that. I mean, there are problems with it, but I mean, it, you know, you have to, as I always say, you have to accept the world as it is. Well, maybe not accept the world, but approach the world as it is and not just think that you're in a real time strategy game where you can create your own system of government with a, you know, pressing a button and and your whole system and you create a new people just through, uh, you know, building process in a strategy game. You know, that's not how things work. You have to approach the world as it is and you have to work within that framework. You just can't, you know, this is not a real time strategy game where you can just invent like a people and a system of government out of thin air and hope that, you know, whatever niche uh, ideology or form of government that you come up with is somehow going to take over the country just because you wrote it down or tweeted about it, which some people like to think about. And when it comes to the Constitution and right wing critiques of it, I never really see an alternative proposed to the Constitution of what type of order is there is. You know, there's a vague anti-constitutionalism. It's like we're done with the Constitution. We're moving forward. It's like, OK, what are you set, setting down and writing down? What are the principles that we're going with? And that gets a little bit murky. And this also this happens a lot with the right when it says, you know, it makes valid critiques of a lot of things. And then it's like, OK, well, what's the alternative we're supposed to be guided by that we're rallying behind? And there it's like, uh, well, um, you know, we'll get to that. You know, and sometimes we're going to be like, well, we're going to create this anti-enlightenment principles or anti-liberal principles. It's like, OK, what does that look like? Uh, you know, what is that stating? And some people will like, well, this will go like this and that. The thing you have to realize is that whatever like thing that we come up with uh, on right wing Twitter or wherever, this is an appeal to the majority of people. This doesn't appeal to the majority of people. I mean, the only type of alternative, which still, uh, you know, doesn't throw argue for throwing out the Constitution, but argues for a uh, different legal reasoning for looking at the Constitution rather than originalism. Where originalism is the most popular conservative legal theory, it's about going back to what the founders originally intended and using those type of arguments in their texts and, and opinions and basing law around that. Um, most of the Supreme Court, conservative Supreme Court justices are originalists or, stay, or say they're originalists. Um, there are problems with it because sometimes of like originalism supports all of progressive ideas. It's like, 
if we follow originalism, it it totally argues for the civil rights regime, which is silly. But I think you can use originalism for uh, keyed reasons. I think it's much easier to make a, a key type of originalism than the alternatives. And the only alternative I've really seen that's like been written out and stated was um, Adrian Vermeule, who's a Harvard professor, integralist, who argued for common good constitutionalism that we're now no longer trying to do originalism. We're no longer trying to look at the founders' intent. We're now going to be basing our reasoning on upholding the common good, which uh, unfortunately for Adrian Vermeule is that this is what liberals do. This is what liberals argue for their principles is basing everything around the common good. You know, vax mandates, it's for the common good. Mass mandates, all this type of ridiculous COVID stuff. It's for the common good, which Vermeule argued for vax mandates and all these other things like gun control, which Vermeule also supports. We have to do it for the gun, for the common good. Hate speech laws, which also Adrian Vermeule supports. Yes, I know he's a, he claims to be conservative, but all these things are what liberals want. But liberals claim we need hate speech laws for the common good. Liberals have already uh, have common good constitutionalism, and it's a disaster because what is defined by the common good is n or what is defined as the common good in America today is not the common good that we on the right would. Um, you know, uphold or see as the common good. But we don't control those institutions that determine the common good. We don't control the universities. We don't control the press. We don't control even a lot of these churches, uh, you know, have a lot of liberals in control of that. And they say, you know, what's the common good? And generally it's what's in the uh, Barack Obama and Joe Biden uh, agendas, that that's what's the common good. And so all these institutions are that determine what's the common good and what the people share are in the enemy's hands. They're not in our hands. So we wouldn't determine the common good. So if we fully adopted common good constitutionalism, it would just allow for more left-wing tyranny on behalf of, of the public good and for helping people. And, you know, that's, you know, that we could see what went wrong there with the New Deal, what went wrong there with LBJ's Great Society and the Civil Rights Regime. All those type of things were based on upholding the common good maybe in a using different phraseology or terminology than saying common good but that's what it was so that's the only alternative that i've actually really legitimately seen that's been spelled out and said you know that and i'm sure there are some out there where it's like well we're going to adopt uh you know <laughs> the principles of absolutist monarchy from the Habsburgs and bring that to america or or, you know, some people will just say, we'll just bring fascism over. We'll just find the fascist constitution or, or the rules that they had in Italy or, or Germany and bring those over. And none of these things are going to work. This is like fringe stuff. This is not going to – you. if you're going out in public and talking to a normal person, they're going to be like, what? What is this? Like, no, I don't want a king. And, you know, there are like people – most Americans don't want a monarchy or any type of that order. And – a lot of like what the right is most effective at is like when they're you know trying to defeat uh, the left's uh, deprivations and their attacks on us is by appealing to the concepts of freedom and liberty. I mean, yeah, it, may it might sound stupid, and I think a lot of millennials and Gen Xers who remember how we got into the Iraq War and how George W. Bush had some of the dumbest, and people who support George W. Bush had the dumbest rhetoric about, we're about freedom, we're in freedom land, this is so much freedom. I understand how, like, how it gets cringe, but you know, when you're getting to the you know principles of defending your right to bear arms you're defending your right to not get a vaccine and to your right to not have your kid mass 24 7 you know you have to appeal to the principles of freedom and liberty and those are effective i mean that's how in a large part how we uh fought back against the uh you know the COVID tyranny that was trying to be imposed on our country and how we were much freer than you know countries like australia and other places and in germany and other places in europe you know that we were able to maintain a greater degree of freedom a large part because of the constitutional order that we have and the laws and you know the greater respect for liberty that we have which does have some consequences i will admit you know there are a lot of negative consequences from that but there are also positive effects of that as we can see uh, there's a couple of other different factors that prevented us from having the type of covid regime that australia and new zealand and others had but you know that's something to keep in mind so i don't i'm not as negative to the constitution 
And well, I don't not bothered by Trump saying terminate because it's like a Trumpy statement. It's like whatever. It's like a funny statement. I, he probably needs to wise up uh, a little bit going into the presidential campaign about this because it, it, I do think it is. Uh, while the the true uh, Greer head pledgers, you know, know that like we're supporting Trump and we get what he's saying, but the ordinary person, I think, uh, they really do want to move on from 2020, both the election and COVID. Uh, that's like the American public, and they don't want to hear anymore trying to... They don't want the 2024 election to be a relitigation of the 2020 election. They want to have moved forward. So I don't. I think Trump does need to avoid some of these statements, but I don't think it's going to be that big of a problem for him. Like, people will forget about this stuff. I mean, there's like... It's like all new controversies. There were so many controversies when Trump was running for president, when he was president, there were, and people were like, this, he's, he's done, he's finished. Like this statement is is out, is beyond the pale, and then he would suddenly, you know, you know, be a week later, and his poll numbers would go up. So there's something there, but I do think he needs to avoid um, or be a little bit more wiser about these statements, because uh, I don't think he's going to be <laughs> reinstalled as president just through a Truth Social post. So there is something to keep in mind there. But going back onto like you know conservative alternatives to the Constitution or rather right-wing alternatives to the Constitution. I do find that rhetoric similar is like, well, we just need to get rid of the Constitution. It's like, what good has it done us? And then they're like, well, what's the alternative? Uh, we'll, we'll get to that. And I, as I said, you know, the Constitution has a lot of good things about it. It is, you know, it has kept us together. It has provided a decent system for us to operate under that has provided a lot of stability and prosperity for us and I, I think a lot there's some good there's a lot of good in it there are some negative things in it but are or rather negative things surrounding it or the philosophy around it that can lead to negative things but it is what it is you have to operate in the world as uh, as it exists not how you imagine it but going along with that that's also when like some of these conservatives talk about how we need to po we need to be post political like it's not only that we're getting rid of the constitution we're just like moving beyond politics and it's like then rarely does this ever get spelled out in what people do people just like imagine like oh we're going to form base communities and 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 these communities are eventually going to take over and stuff ah, you know if you're going to form like a community of like-minded people like i think that's a good thing and that but you're still going to have to operate in the world of politics and also the if you're absconding from politics uh, the government could come and just end your base community for whatever reason. If they're passing laws that you're like ending hate speech or uh, further eroding freedom of association, you know, it could be very difficult for you to operate in that base community if you're not involved in politics. And so whenever people talk about this and the alternative, you know, yeah, like forming healthy, you know, like-minded communities are good, uh, but they're not the ultimate solution to these things. And you still have to be involved in politics to prevent your, you know, community from being overrun by the system. You know, the system isn't just be like, all right, we're going to become a tyranny, but we'll allow you to have your base community in the in the wilderness. That's not how things work. They're just if they become a tyranny, they're going to come after your community. So you have to be involved in the political process as it exists. Like there is no like alternative like political process. Some people are like we're going to influence culture. Uh, you know, there's nothing wrong with creating you know good culture, but uh, you know, culture is in the hands of our enemies, our mass culture, if you're reaching an audience. So often, like the culture we produce, right-wingers produce, is just enjoyed by people within the community. Nobody, it doesn't reach people outside, which the point of making, which people make for making, um, for focusing more on culture is that by focusing on culture elements, we will reach uh, more people that if we just focus on writing novels or, or trying to make films, which we don't have the money to make films. And, and I mean, Daily Wire is making films, but it's just for only people watching those films. I think it's like an interesting model what Daily Wire is. I think some of the movies are kind of cringe, but, uh, you know, it is like enjoyed by their audience and the audience wants that type of stuff. But you really are making that stuff more so for people who want an alternative from the woke stuff and are already fully conservative or fully right wing rather than reaching the uh, unenlightened masses uh, that you would for other culture you know and especially it's probably the true with like the writing i think like some of the movies maybe if daily wire does create a blockbuster it would be a big deal but i mean the blockbuster would have probably be very cringe and not that uh not the type of right-wing uh, ideology that we'd want to promote but 
So people always like talk about it. It's like, it's like more focused on culture. And it's like, there are some things that are preventing that. I think, no, that's not saying. Uh, some people made the argument that like the way to support culture is just to uh, support extreme right wingers who are making rather apolitical culture and just like, you know, reading them and supporting them in any way you can. I, I'm up for that or just people who, you know, subtly put in these themes, which you couldn't even see that in some uh, Hollywood directors who are doing that. You know, there's some like very unwoke movies that came out, like The Northman that came out uh, earlier this year. Uh, I'd be hard pressed to say it was like right wing, but it was our, our traditionally right wing, but it was certainly not woke. And I think we need more movie. And it was uh, uh, an intelligent film and an interesting film, though I would like to see more of. I thought it was a very good film. So, and that was done by somebody who was operating within Hollywood system. Or other movies like Top Gun, which you know didn't really have any woke elements, was a huge blockbuster. Just by supporting these films that are you know, don't have the far left messaging or anything like that. And, you know, say, telling the Hollywood that like, hey, this is what is popular. This is what sells. We'll encourage Hollywood to do that. And you can even see that example with the Disney movies. You know, they've been having some recent box office bombs uh, with woke films like the recent was Strange World, which had a, a mixed race family with gay themes. In it. And it's like really ugly family, too. Um, like the animation and all that, and it bombed at the box office and it's showing that people don't want this woke stuff. And that's so just like that type of reaction just by the people, uh, you know, voting with your feet. And, you know, even having that type of analysis and making sure that that analysis and reaction gets out there that like strange world failed because it was too woke. You know, it, it does have an impact on the culture. Which, as I always try to argue, like, you know, conservatives get very mad. Uh, you know, sometimes they'll talk about boycotting. But if you ever bring up boycotting the NFL, you know, you you then create the reaction that the most important thing the right can do is watching the NFL and attacking anyone who tears, tell them to boycott it. But as I, you know, people then look at these like woke bombs and maybe seeing some changes at Disney and then they're like, it's because people like react, reject this stuff, not because they're going to watch it as like some people think will happen with the NFL. Like if you continue to watch it and continue to see the BLM messaging from it, that somehow the NFL will uh, change in a positive direction. That, like that's not how things work. A little bit of a sidetrack with the culture thing. We got a lot to discuss today, so I don't want to get uh, too focused on that. I might do an IQ supplement on that on how the right... Uh, views culture and, and and addresses it and some of these ideas that are going on and the best way to do it. But to end on the Constitution thing, I have to say that this is a simple thing that I think most of the listeners understand is that the true threat to Constitution is not from Trump uh, doing uh, some goofy true social posts. It's from the left. The left has done this many times before. We saw this in 2020 with the COVID mandates and the COVID regime that they're trying to impose on us that totally dispense with the Constitution and with their desire to implement gun control and hate speech laws. They are the true threat to the Constitution, not Trump. And I always made this point. Like People are like, oh, if Trump gets another term, he'll be a true dictator. It's like, he doesn't have the ability. Like, look at the first term. Like, what type of dictatorship did you see in his first term? It's like, oh, he was really mean to journalists. Like, that's all they say. And it's like, oh, he said shit whole countries like we can't have this like they don't point out anything if you look at what biden did if you look at what obama did if you look at what the left wants to do they are a far greater threat to our freedoms and liberties and the constitution than trump and it's so stupid to think that trump is the true dictator when you know he couldn't even get the pentagon and this would be the same for any republican he couldn't even get the pentagon to go against rioters like he had to worry about the Pentagon trying to overthrow him in that summer of 2020 during the riots. He had to find like other federal law enforcement to come and protect him and protect him and deal with the rioters in D.C. So it's like, you know, when he had a dictatorship moment, uh, the system showed that it was willing to overthrow Trump even if he tried. So that's just something to keep in mind. And that would have happened with any Republican president, by the way, uh, not just a Trump thing. So. That is it on that topic. And going on to other Republican presidential candidates, um, Ron DeSantis is having an interesting moment. Florida may reverse its decision to strip Walt Disney of its ability to govern a part of Florida on its own. This is a big thing last year, or actually this year, 
Almost, we're almost past 2022. I'm already wanting to say it was last year, but no, it's we're still in 2022. And this is a huge moment of like DeSantis takes it a woke capital, like Trump would never do this. And they stripped Disney of its ability to govern a part of its area that it's involved in, in Florida. And this was seen as a retaliation against woke capitalism and, and Disney trying to get involved in its uh, anti-groomer education bill that DeSantis championed. So this is like a big deal. But they're now apparently going to give them that power back because they have a new CEO or, well, not a new CEO. They have the old CEO back with Bob Iger. And Bob Iger is trying to be more conciliatory to Florida and them like, you know, we we we're sorry we got in the political debate, but we'll get back. And it's likely that Florida's gonna get make the deal. But the deal is probably gonna be the same as before. So this is like something that they made a big fuss about. Like this was like a huge deal. This showed how Florida means business. And at the end of the day, it's uh, you know, it returns. It's very much a Ron DeSantis move. It's like when the cameras are there, he makes a big stunt. It looks very tough. It looks like it's solid. And then when the cameras go away, they return to the status quo or, and they backtrack. I mean, they did this with the migrant flights. The migrant flights got a ton of attention, was like shown like this is state power, effective state power. He read rules for radicals. Like this is what all right wing, this is all what all Republican governors need. Like this is the first time they've ever used state power. All these ridiculous claims. And then after, you know, the media attention died down and he saw the backlash against it, you know, with him being investigated, you know, lawsuits coming out. They canceled all flights, you know, all future flights. And have stopped talking about it. They no longer care about that issue. And yet he took all this credit. So this could be very much the same with Florida. And I I am doubtful that Disney is going to just like become anti-woke. Bob Iger is a huge liberal. Bob Iger is the reason why Disney went very left wing in the first place. You know, when he's CEO. And sometimes people even talk about him as a possible Democratic presidential candidate. Now all of conservative media is like, finally, Bob, a base Bob Iger is taking it, wokeness to the woodshed. I mean, like the guy who replaced Shepek, uh, I guess uh, yeah, Shepek, uh, who was the previous CPO or CEO, CPO, he was the previous CEO. You know, he was a little bit uh, not as just as competent and, you know, kind of like flailed about, didn't have the type of. Uh, composure that Iger had and Iger but Iger like is one of the reasons that Disney is woke in the first place is left wing and now they're just saying well we're not gonna get so political which is that that's all the basics you have to do to like make the right turn into soy jacks and start clapping like seals Disney is still gonna produce woke content they're still gonna be making a lot of the same shit they may not make such uh, abominations as strange world but they'll do stuff that is like similar it's not like Iger is going to start, we're going to now create conservative cartoons. No, he's not going to do that. He's not a conservative himself. He still is committed to like left-wing projects and stuff, but he just wants to handle these situations a lot better than the previous CEO. And for that, like conservatives are now like, get woke, go broke, which once again, these people are who say that are wearing NFL jerseys and and getting extremely mad at anyone who would tell them to not watch the NFL due to the NFL's left-wing things. And as I keep bringing up the NFL, the NFL disproves the idea that the, you know, of get woke, go broke. Instead, it's get woke and we'll get really mad if you tell us to boycott this, this company. But back to DeSantis, it is an interesting moment for him um, if he does this. I do really think that this shows the DeSantis way is that he does a big thing. It's, you know, gets a lot of attention, but at the end of the day, it just fizzles and, you know, he backtracks and, and gives up on it. It's also the same with like his silly tax censorship bill that didn't actually address tax censorship at all. It was just a, it was total PR move that everyone's like, this is so big, this is important. And then it got quickly shot down in court and he never talks about it again, never talks about the migrant flights. And it's going to be probably the same with Disney is that, you know, all these supposed victories that he made, they're not going to be standing if he runs for president. Well, he is going to run for president when he runs for president. So that is interesting in that regard, but it is what it is. It's, t it's typical uh, DeSantis stuff. Now I'm going to bring up a cognitive elite question and then go to another topic that's not a cognitive elite question. And then we're going to go to the cognitive elite, to the rest of the cognitive elite questions. 
Hopefully you guys all understood that. I'm bringing this one up because of deals with DeSantis. And so, as a reminder, you too can get the power to ask me questions or suggest guests and topics if you sign up for the Con of Elite option at Highly Respected Substack, and that's at Highly Respected dot substack dot com and make sure to sign up for the iq supplements if you haven't already this question comes from johnny chungus who is a frequent um, asker of questions this is a question directed after or uh, inspired by the last iq summit that i did on the film vice which was about a dick cheney was a standard liberal tripe that it really felt like a liberal artifact from like the late 2000s and it was made 10 years later <laughs> in 2018 and it is depicted a type of left that still thought of George W. Bush and Dick Cheney as the worst uh, as the worst thing ever and fascist which they now no longer think of and they now view these people as heroes because they're not Trump and so Chungus Mr. Chungus asks the podcast made me wonder about a specific hypothetical how would the me lib media and Hollywood treat a hypothetical President DeSantis? What would the liberalism under President DeSantis resemble? Would it be like how McKay, Adam McKay was the director of Vice, portrayed the Bush Cheney, Bush Cheney admin, for instance, how the left treated Trump are fairly different to both and something new? Just curious, because I'm torn on whether they'd go for the pre-Trump approach or the Trump approach in this hypothetical. It would be more of a pre-Trump approach because a big difference between Trump and DeSantis is that conservative media would be all would be universally for DeSantis and not in, in the type of reluctant support that Trump had, which conservative media had to drop its never Trumpism because their audience was so pro-Trump. But they were always reluctant Trump supporters and they'd always find r reasons to criticize him. And when you have that whole industry behind Trump and also every conservative guest who would come on to like CNN and MSNBC would probably be, you know, DeSantis supporters, unlike what happened under Trump, you know, it, it created a different impression. Also, there's like changes in media like CNN is moving away from trying to be the more like Jerry Springer libtard uh, network that they were under Trump. Like tr under Trump, they were just so ridiculous. Like pre-Trump, they were seen as the neutral network. Uh, you know, MSNBC was liberal, conservative was, uh, Fox News was conservative. Of course, CNN lean liberal, but they try to do more straight news and not like to total opinions. But what they had is now they had their straight news anchors go into these liberal lectures about how evil Trump is. And then they'd encourage their guests to go over the top. There are so many uh, guests who would go drop F-bombs and, and really act outrageously between uh, on Trump. And there's like times like Rick Wilson like threatened to gut like a Trump. I think it was uh, Steve Cortez. He threatened to gut a Trump supporter like a fish. You know, there was like like weird threats. No, what they would have is they would have like one Trump supporter, usually somebody like Steve Cortez or somebody like that. And then they'd have like a whole panel where the the host and then like five real bull guests and they'd all like do a dog pile of this Trump supporter and they'd be like, you are sick. I would kill you. And they would go through these hyperbolic statements and just these r wild denunciations. And it was just like all like it was worse than MSNBC. MSNBC came off as more straight news than CNN. But now CNN, due to the new ownership of who they've been in the layoffs, they're trying to move back to a less partisan way. I don't know if this could work out, but probably under DeSantis, they would try not to be as hyperbolic towards him as with Trump. And I think that would reflect a lot of the other media trends. Like I think New York Times and Washington Post, like a big difference between how they covered Trump and Bush, like the opinion sections of New York Times, Washington Post would be, you know, hyperbolic about Bush and how evil he was. But the straight news side would try to keep it a little bit more level. Well, that was not the same with Trump. With Trump, they would just say, Trump, who has been credibly accused of being a fascist, like that would be like a straight news item, who falsely, who regularly threatens our democracy. And this would be in the like straight news stories in like New York Times, Washington Post. I don't think they would do that with DeSantis. So it would probably be something like we've seen with George W. Bush, you know, you'd have like the columnists who call him a fascist and that stuff, but it wouldn't be as, uh, oh, as over the top with Trump or as, as prevalent as with Trump. 
And you would probably not see this resistance cottage industry that you've seen build up around hating Trump that emerged with, or rather emerged around Trump, you know, the resistance tards and like the like Lincoln Project. I think a lot of that would probably go away under DeSantis. It would be like a return to politics. I don't want to say as normal, but more normal than Trump. And some people want that, but I mean, that's not really our goal because it would mean an acceptance of a lot of these larger trends going on in our society, and it would just be coming to terms with it, which Trump is more, is showing that we're not coming to terms with these trends and we, and we want resistance towards it, but I think it would be an acceptance of those trends that are happening. And due to that acceptance, I think liberals would lower the temperature and not be as hyperbolic, but the... Trends that we care about, you know, the demographic stuff and the cultural stuff, that would just continue on in the same trajectory as under Trump. But, you know, it would be not as virulent uh, as we saw in the Trump era and, and, and going into Biden. So you may, you know, lower temperature, but same uh, decline, American decline, uh, going at the same pace as it was before, but just done with a different tone and style. And so that's what I would think, it, you know, and the, the claims that a lot of conservatives would make is like they are going to treat DeSantis like they're going to they're going to love Trump in comparison with DeSantis, which. No, they may say like, well, Trump couldn't get this done or stuff, but they're they're probably not They're It's not going to be Trump is not going to be rehabilitated towards how like authoritarian DeSantis is. And DeSantis is not going to be the Caudillo or Caesar that all of his fans think he's going to be. He's going to be, you know, a slightly better George W. Bush. I think you can trust him on like illegal immigration, which is something you couldn't trust uh Bush would do, you know, Bush try to push amnesty. I don't think DeSantis would push amnesty. He'd be good on, he'd be good on crime. Uh, but outside of that, I mean, probably be a lot of the standard stuff you saw under Bush. I don't know. You might not see uh, another Iraq war, but you could. And it's a greater possibility under DeSantis than under Trump. So, but I've talked about that enough. Uh, DeSantis versus Trump. But I think when it comes to liberal would it be more pre-Trump? There would be some, like, how they treated Trump uh, with there. There's not going to be a total return, but it's going to be... And I also don't think that they're going to make as much money off of anti-DeSantis hate that they did with Trump, which is why the media went in that direction, because they saw subscriptions going up. They saw higher ratings by uh, appealing to wine ants, deranged wine ants and stuff. I don't think he, there's going to be as much ratings bonanza and subscriptions bonanza as there was with anti-Trump hate as with anti-DeSantis hate. And so that will that will affect how they cover DeSantis versus Trump. So I had another topic I wanted to get into today was about the situation in Europe and Britain, but I need to devote more time to it than it's than we have in this episode. So I might do either an IQ supplement or save that up for next week. I do have another topic I want to discuss about that's not kind of elite or related. And it's the fact of what is American culture or people or what people discuss of American culture. Because I see this a lot of discussion over the cultural topic. We talked about the cultural discussion before, but that's like in the in the context of how politics can influence culture or how we can use culture to influence politics. But there's a separate discussion over what is American culture or how it functions, whether there is a unifying American culture and that regard i've seen discussions of there's a this common theme that you will sometimes come into contact with where people insist there is an authentic folk american culture that is out there you know maybe the college grads don't understand it they're not in with it but if you go out into the hinterlands and you will find this truly authentic and genuine american culture that is comparable to what you would find in European folk cultures and this stuff. And I've always made this argument, and this is not so much denigrating a rural America or putting them down, but really there are, and also making this point, or going back before I make that point, going rewinding a little bit, people argue for this to say that there is this fake American culture that is out there that's put out by the regime, but in fact, there's these authentic regional cultures that survive intact and 
you know, there's no universal American culture and that we're just too different. And some pe people either use this for an argument for national divorce is that the regions are just so different and there's nothing in common between them. So they just must split apart. Or the other purpose is that there's this growing revolution or rebellion of the authentic American culture people and they're about to wipe away the fake American culture from when it's, so it's used to, for this. And generally people are not very specific. This is a very big problem when it comes to this. Like people talk in vague terms about the, uh, you know, huge differences and cult the cultural differences between the regions and things. And then when it gets to the, the you know, the details, you know, they're a little uh, sparse on those details. They'll just say, are they going to history or they'll say, well, they were like this in the 1930s. Or, you know, they have a different form of dancing or something like this. And this is like not the type of culture that the majority of Americans participate in, even with among rural Americans. And I always want to make this point is that the type of culture enjoyed by urbanites or whatever, whatever term they would call or even suburbanites is basically the same culture that is enjoyed by rural Americans, particularly young people. Young people also, you know, listen to rap. They also, no matter what region they live in, they talk in a similar manner. I mean, this they watch the same media and TV, which is a lot of where their way of talking comes from is like TV or the media that they're consuming. You know, it's it's in, the accents are still influenced by where they grow up and stuff, but also a lot of the words they use and and you know the way they express themselves is influenced by media, and they're consuming the same type of media and culture as Americans in other places. You know, this is a little bit of a black pill, but at probably no point in American history have we had a more homogenized shared culture among Americans than today. I mean, even you could argue maybe in the Cold War, I, I would say you maybe had more shared values in the Cold War era. And well, I, I would actually would go back on that. I think there's more similar frames of reference for culture, maybe in the Cold War era. But, you know, there was a lot of diversity and true diversity, not the type of racial diversity, but the type of diversity in America in differences in regions and how they operated it in the culture. Now, there was like very great similarities in that they were primarily of Anglo stock or Northern European stock, or really just white people, predominantly Protestant. Some areas were more Catholic than others, but and, you know, had a lot of them were more engaged in agricultural pursuits and, you know, pr previous times, you know, differences between urban and, and rural life, of course. But today, the type of culture and by culture, you know, about diet and cuisine, uh, ways of viewing the world and ways of traditions and that stuff, you know, you, there's not as many differences as you would think. I mean, there are some subtle, there are some things that uh, hobbies and, and other pursuits that rural rural lights will engage in that others don't, you know, they'll be more into hunting and fishing than maybe uh, urbanite bug men, you know, even though a lot of urbanites like to do those stuff too, maybe not as common, but they'll do, and they'll have some different activities that they'll maybe in, be into. And even the regional differences, you know, most of the, like people in rural Michigan is at, listen to country music and as just like the people in rural South Carolina, like they listen to the same music, they watch the same movies, they enjoy the same media for the most part. You know, the main difference is, is, you know, they have a different accent and their activities are structured around the different weather that they have. You know, hockey is going to be bigger in the north than it is going to be in the south. Those type of differences. But that's not like... Wow, you can't you can't just have a unified country if one area prefers playing hockey and the other area prefers playing football. You know, those are not the type of uh, things that create like separation. It's like we're just too different, even though they're both speaking English to each other. They're both listening to the same music, both enjoying the same movies, enjoying and even the way they interact in similar terms. You know, they can understand each other. Uh, you know, there's not that quite as much of a difference. There's also not quite this difference of, you know, this age old tale of like, oh, our son goes off to the city or to college and he comes back completely different. Like we're uh, foreign ways, which that's no like people in rural areas are well aware of the ways elsewhere because they share the same ways and culture of elsewhere in this country.
You know, as I've said before, there are four pillars of modern American culture. I would say this is modern American culture for those under 40, maybe under 45. And it's rap, weed, NFL, and Marvel. And it, you can add other things into there like Star Wars, Disney, other things, uh, you know, the other sports leagues. And yeah, that, that creates like a unified American culture within that. Now, I think for people like us who think like us, they may be disgusted with a lot of what goes for mainstream American culture. They may not like what is mainstream American culture. There is like some, you know, a difference among the older Americans, but they're not going to be around forever. And they're not necessarily passing down um, base boomer culture. And even for them, like their type of culture is just like a different type of music that they listen to. Maybe it's like, uh, rock instead of rap, or I would say rock is superior. Maybe even in, you could say even country, but country itself also is heavily influenced by rap and R&B today. So it's not like that that's completely separated from the rest of American culture. And country music itself, when it became more popular in the, uh, or more, you know, its form was more better defined into the 60s and 70s, became a way of universalizing all of these different regional rural cultures and that you know it's share it's showing the shared uh, identity between them you know as i said there's not going to be much difference between you know maybe an accent maybe in the type of habits and maybe their pastimes they may do but there's a lot of similarities between someone who lives in rural wyoming rural illinois and rural south carolina rural louisiana you know there's a lot of similarities between them. And there's even a lot of similarities between those people and those who live in suburbs. I mean, it may just be a different type of lifestyle they live, but they can understand each other. They're like, have you seen this new movie? Yeah, I have, or I'm aware of it. You know, and they're not going to be like, that's completely foreign. You know, it's like, what is this strange way that he's dressing? And some people just try to say like, oh, it's just too many differences between them. Like, uh, they say soda instead of Coke here. We have to we have to separate. So that's one thing that comes into mind. And as I always make this point with, you know, and a lot of these arguments are made that like these normies are out there living and, and upholding this traditional grand American folk culture that has been around for centuries that people want to say, you know, that's a bit of a delusion. It's a bit of a delusion that that's that's there. I mean, it doesn't address how America is fundamentally different. There's a lot of nice areas of America that are not paused and are not upholding the pause, but they're not exactly upholding this type of folk culture that people think that is like abundantly, oh, that is abundant as soon as you exit an urban area. And going back to this point of a shared culture, I really do think it comes to this point. I, I, I mean, I repeat a lot of these arguments all the time, so some of the listeners are probably familiar with it. But it comes to this point where it does provide a unifying glue for people just to at least remain content and they're not wanting to divorce because you have to have serious, you know, if you're looking at something like the Yugoslav Wars, you know, there's like serious cultural differences between Croats and Serbs, even though they speak the same language and are genetically very similar, you know, they're, they had very different cultures. It was based around religious and histories and of history of animosity towards each other. You don't have that between the Midwest and the South. And some people can just move in between these places like, oh, you know, there's a little bit different, you know, maybe they drink beer here rather than another alcoholic beverage. And these are minor differences, but it's like people want to say like, oh, they drink wine here or they drink, they call Coke, uh, they call soda Coke here. They, totally different time to separate, which it's not a basis for separation. And when it comes to the nature of sports, you know, I always make this point all the time, which People have like their in, in entertainment and pastimes. People are always going to have this. I'm not telling people to drop everything and just focus on politics and uh, black metal or something like that. You can have a lot of normal pastimes. But I do make the exception for a lot of with NFL because I feel like NFL is the one thing that if you can drop that and if you can drop all these other, you know, cultural foundations as the Greer had pledged states, you know, you're able to free your mind and and think beyond the American mainstream because the American mainstream culture is something that is antithetical to our ideas and what we're about. And it's very hard to 
push for our ideas and stuff. And, you know, people, as I talked about earlier in the podcast, like people wanted to talk about creating an authentic culture in this. Well, I mean, the first step is to ex- exit from normie mainstream culture and it's and it's four pillars. And if you can't do that, then like, you know, you're not going to build that type of authentic culture. But it, it does provide like sports does provide that type of which it, it is like it's fine. I mean, people need to get their escape and, and, you know, have their free time. But it does create a way for people to accept the present order and the status quo and not be worried about things. And this was found within the opening lead of, a, of an article written by uh, Tim Miller, who's this horrible never Trumper, uh, gay never Trumper, who has been involved in, I think he's been involved in the Lincoln Project and other things. He writes for the Bulwark. He's a really, kind of, he's a really awful human being. Uh, he made a bet in 2016 that Trump would, would lose and with an anonymous guy, they bet a certain amount of money. And when Trump lost, he blocked the guy and refused to pay and never acknowledged that he had made this bet. Uh, and he's like very nasty, you know, person towards like his former colleagues because he was like a Republican strategist who worked for the uh, Jeb Bush campaign. And even during the early Trump years, he was actually, even though he's like a never Trumper and writing these articles for the Bulwark, he was making a lot of money through Trumpian PR and, and, and working for, you know, advocating for ideas and, and policies associated with Trump, just making money off it. And it was exposed and he lost his um I forget what he he was working with a mainstream group. Uh, maybe he was like a he was a contributor somewhere and he lost that. Anyway, he had this whole point about how the Hunter Biden thing is a nothing burger and you shouldn't worry about it. And he was trying to uphold the status of how awesome normal Americans are and how they're much superior to conservative weirdos. And Tim Miller himself is not a normal person. He is not a normal person by any any metric. But every per, like right wing Twitter, he tries to pretend that he's normal to in order to act superior towards the right wing weirdos. But in this case, he's doing this to promote liberalism rather than whatever right wing ideology that people on Twitter like to do. This normie larping to own uh, whoever they're arguing with. But in this opening lead, he revealed that, you know, it was like a it was like a mock of my uh, tweets about how, you know, if you want to rebel against the World Economic Forum, it's time to turn on uh, the game and go to Buffalo Wild Wings. Well, he did this unironically, but it was not revolting against a World Economic Forum. You're revolting against Trumpism. So he wrote this while normal humans who denied Republicans their red wave were enjoying an epic sports weekend, an insular community of MAGA activists and online contrarians led by the world's richest man for now, were getting riled up about a cache of leaked emails revealing that the former actor James Woods and Chinese troll accounts were not allowed to post ill-gotten photos of Hunter Biden's hog and a private company's microblogging platform 25 months ago. So the implication here is that the normies don't care about the Hunter Biden story or any of these type of right wing media stories because what they're doing is enjoying an epic sports weekend like normal people should. They're watching the USA game against um, the Netherlands and they're going off and they're just enjoying life as it is. And they're not they're not getting worried. They're ignoring politics and just focusing on sports. And that's epically based. And so some people argue that at times is that you should need to stop worrying about politics and be post-political. But the post-political future looks like that. That's what it looks like. It, it's a they're having an epic sports weekend and ignoring actually important news. And they're just so superior to right wing weirdos who would care about this stuff, which in, and also the way Tim Miller frames it is that once again, it's just about dick pics when it's actually about much more than that. But the overall point is that that cultural bond that the NFL and uh, World Cup and others do provide that glue for people to remain committed to the status quo and to be content with it as long as that programming is on. And if so if you want real change, if you want especially to the culture or to politics, you really have to take the Greer Head Pledge. Or may, you may have, there may be some exceptions. The one exception I would have is like the NFL mainly because in order to uh, interact with people like, you know, friends, family, coworkers, 
you do need to have some basic knowledge of sports because uh, I can tell you, like, just going up, you know, even when I worked at normal places, just having some knowledge of sports, it could, you know, you'll have a rapport with your coworkers and stuff just knowing that stuff. And a lot of the weirdos I know from friends who work in still normal places say that the real weirdos are more into Marvel movies than they are into, like, the NFL. So I, I understand some points about it. You you can still follow it and, you know, just to keep up with, like, your friends and family and coworkers and stuff. So there is a point to it, but I think the other three, there's, like, you really have to cut off. And if you're wanting to, you know, talk about how the right needs to focus on culture, you need to first focus on dropping the negative cultural aspects that are affiliated with modern America. Because that stuff is what a modern America is, much more so than whatever... Uh, type of things that you know people on Twitter or and online will say is like the real American folk culture. This is the stuff that is actually you know participates and you know connects people in this country, and it connects people around very negative aspects. Are accepting things like Black Lives Matter, gay rights, uh, you know the trans agenda. You know these type of things are used to make people accept these ideas. And by dropping them and trying to find a new culture, and I think really what a task is, is that you are going to have to form, uh, you know, create a new culture in America. What it's going to look like, I'm not quite certain yet, but it's something that we'll have to create over time. I don't think that there's enough remnants of the folk culture here to serve as that. You know, some people are like, well, we'll... We'll bring back clog dancing or something to revolt. I mean, not if you want to do clog dancing, that's cool. But I don't know if everyone's going to be into down for clog dancing or whatever have you. And it's only a few part of, you know, a certain segment of America where that is their traditional culture. So it's going to be created something new uh, over time because there's not much left of an authentic folk culture in America. And there's not much of a high culture either. So it's up to us to create something new to challenge and be an alternative to the mainstream American culture that we can now see evident in weed, rap, NFL, and Marvel movies. And so those are my concluding thoughts on that. And now we're going to finish up with the other three conflict questions. And I'm going to do the reminder again. As a reminder, you too can get the power to ask me questions or suggest guests and topics if you sign up at for. If you sign up for the Cognolite option at Highly Respected Substack, and that's at highlyrespected.substack.com. And while you're there, and if you haven't already, make sure to sign up for the IQ supplements. People love them. They get really informed and learn a lot from them, and their IQ is boosted by them. So these questions are coming. We have two questions from one person and one question from another person. And the first two questions come from Jay. A thing I realize is that all the people asking questions today have a name that begins with J. So a lot of J, <laughs> J's involved today. Uh, so this first question J, J asks is like, Scott, you recently did a show about the movie Vice. A lot of people were getting inspired by this IQ supplement. This is why you got to sign up for the IQ supplements. Where you talked about liberals from the 90s. Where would you, well, it's actually 90s and 2000s. Where would you classify some of the legacy liberals from that area like Michael Tracy, Jimmy Dore, Glenn Greenwald, Matt Taibbi? I know they're not our guys, but they're often at odds with the left these days. Come to think of it, I'd probably put Destiny in this category too. This group seems to be big enough to identify at this point, but what's the highly respected opinion? I would say that they're now more contrarians or, or enlightened centrists. Like Tracy, Door, and Greenwald are inherently contrarians, and they never fit fully on the left. Like, Glenn Greenwald was always committed to free speech. He did work with, um, he did some, like, legal work. I think maybe it was at, when he was doing the ACLU, or maybe it was, like, on his own, where he did work for uh, some, like, neo-Nazi group. It was not, like, because he agreed with him, but just because he was that committed to the First Amendment. Door, I'm not sure too, too sure about Door's history, but I think that they just really cannot stand the rest of the left, and they really like poking them in the eye, and they're also rewarded by uh, the right and Tucker Carlson by getting in there. I mean, Taibbi was like a was probably the biggest deal among. Well, Greenwald was too at one point, but Taibbi, you know, his stuff on the crash, uh, you know, the recession in 2008 was much loved by the left. And he was a big left-wing writer in the early 2010s. Like they were all like, if you saw it, Taibbi, it was like saying like 
big left wing reporter. Same with a similar extent to Greenwald. But I, I don't know if you would put these people on the left today. I don't know that how much about Destiny's current arc. I know he's like hanging out with uh, Nick Fuentes and some other people like that. But I, I'm not sure. They, I, they may have had a falling out. I'm, <laughs> I don't follow Destiny too much or are familiar with him. But some of these guys, they're very naturally contrarians and they like questioning orthodoxy and they don't like going along with the flow and by that order they're willing to question and confront the left because they view them as too stodgy too stale just too reliant on on platitudes and just like appealing to authority and order and this is what you have to believe because this is just what what is what's true and right and so by that they reject that and they move it but I don't know if I would call them legacy liberals. I mean, they still hate Bush and Cheney, but it, so do a lot of the right now, and some of their arguments are shared by the right. So I'd say some of these guys are no longer on the left. I would not consider Tracy a, a leftist, even though he may consider himself one. Greenwald, I find most of his opinions are like right wing today, but he still has that left wing reputation. Taibbi still like a man. Uh, I was still on the left, uh, but I, it's hard to place them anywhere because even a lot of their opinions. The similarity between them is contrarianness, which I'm not using as a negative. I think it's actually very refreshing. And I don't think that they're simply doing this just because they want to be different. I think that they do have genuine arguments against the left. And they. I think a lot of them are right. And I support that. But, they're, but they are contrarians by nature, especially Michael Tracy. And they, you know, are different now. So they don't fully fit on the left. Um Maybe like if the intellectual dark web was still a thing, they would be on there, but they're still different. They have a different style from the intellectual dark web. Uh, enlightened centrists maybe be one, but they, they still have some very left wing views on like the economy and stuff. So it's a different take, but it's, um, you know, maybe like Roganites because they're all, I think all, maybe not Tracy and maybe not Destiny. Destiny's kind of his own thing. You know, he's a hardcore rationalist and stuff like that, or at least he claims to be. But like Dorr, Greenwald, Tybee, they're right up Rogan's alley. And, you know, Rogan is like a kind of a mix between libertarianism and questioning the present order and going in there, but not going too far where you're going into like really dangerous territory, even though some of these guys go into that dangerous territory. I know Tracy and Greenwald especially. Um but at Roganites, it would maybe be the best way to frame this as what they're about, even though Rogan's probably a little bit more libertarian. But it's not so much of a particular politi political ideology. It's more of a style and an attitude that they uphold that's very similar to other Roganites that you would say. So that would probably be the best way to frame them. I don't know if I would put all of them still on the left now, even though they still have left-wing reputation. So that's a, that's a good question, but... It's hard to give them a name, but Roganites is probably the best name I can think of. And that's for Joe Rogan, for those who don't. Uh, Roganites is named after Joe Rogan, for those who may be curious of what I'm getting the Roganites from. Jay, so next, moving on, Jay's next question is a little bit more complicated. And he's asking, um, you know, about management and, you know, I'll read it in full. I have an observation about the corporate world I would like to sh get your opinion on. The observation is related to the Pareto 80-20 rule. And this is Vilfredo Pareto, who is a big uh, thinker in elite, th elite theory. A lot of right-wingers not like to read him. In my field, the top 20% people are the only ones capable of anything. But the top 20% of that 20% do the vast amount of heavy lifting and account for the majority of productivity. In my estimation, it's about 4 to 5% of people that account for the majority of productivity. Now those people generally do not require a lot of direction and management. My observation, mental management people have a natural conflict with this 4 to 5% of productive people because mental management thrive in an environment that requires more coordination, communication, and status checking. I think mental management have been more eager to accept offshoring and immigration over the last 20 years because there is a benefit to them in doing this. My question, do you, do you see any connection between here and mental management and immigration? There probably is a connection there because, I mean, it is like the corporate world, but I think you know, basing this totally around mental management is probably not the best way of viewing it because there's not like a mental management lobbying group. It's not like the the Michael Scotts of the world have their own lobby group and they want to lobby for more immigrants because they want more they want more of a reason for their job. 
I think it's, uh, you know, immigration is a part of larger trends that we don't have, uh, you know, they're still cheaper. You know, a lot of these corporations don't want to move to full automation. They still think it's better just to get cheap foreign labor to do these jobs that they could easily automate, such as, you know, a fast food cashiers or even picking fruit. You know, we could imagine if we had robots picking fruit. Instead of doing this uh, automation that they want, you know, and involved in agriculture and stuff, they just go to they go to simply recruiting cheap foreign labor to come here and they pay them a penance of wage. And that's just how it works. Middle management may, you know, that may benefit them because they're, uh, you know, it requires more purpose for their job because, you know, if there's a lot of competent people, there's no reason for middle management to be there. But if there's a lot of incompetent people. Maybe they don't understand English and there's a lot of uh, oversight that they need, then that creates more of a need for middle management. So middle management probably does benefit from that immigration angle, but there are larger trends that are going on that explain why a lot of the corporate world wants immigration. They always want cheap labor. They feel that they can't get that cheap labor from America. And sometimes they claim that, you know, Americans won't do these jobs. Uh, Sometimes that's spurious, such as them, you know, getting H-1Bs to replace white collar workers. Sometimes that's a little bit, you know, better, uh, better sourced in reality, such as a lot of these agricultural jobs, which, I mean, if they weren't having illegal migrants doing those jobs, they would be having blacks. <laughs> and a lot of these corporations prefer illegal immigrants over blacks. Whether that's the right decision is um, up to the listener. But to the question, there probably is, the middle management probably does benefit from immigration, but I don't think that they're responsible for encouraging immigration. So that'd be my answer on that. Now for the fourth and final question from another J. It's from Jack. He asked, he was asking about, he was actually a music question, but he said, have there been any good music releases this year that we should check out? The only one I had to go back and think, because I, you know, <laughs> Once you get older, you, the years run by. So sometimes like, is this came out in 2021 or 2022? The one album I'm for certain that came out in 2022 that was very good. It comes from a French black metal band, Vehemence Ordelis. It's very good. It's in the French language. It's uh, pretty melodic. I think it's even for you, if you, you know, casual black metal listener, you should get into it. It's not some of the more... Uh, intimidating stuff to get into so i think that was pretty good that's the one release i'd have to think about it a little bit more and go back on whether uh and assessing whether this release is from 2021 or 2022 for some of them i think it came out in very early 2022 this album so but it's very good so that's one thing and then he asked thoughts on the new metallica single plus album announcement i thought the single was good but nothing groundbreaking for them i've actually not listened to the new metallica single i've probably not listened to any new metallica except for that horrible um collaboration they did with with lou reed uh lulu it was terrible it's like oh we're so artistic we're metallica we're gonna do this it was awful album I, I listened to Death Magnetic when it came out in 2008. I, I thought I was just kind of uh, recycling a lot of their old riffs and stuff. It was it was okay, but it wasn't great. Um, I remember seeing some of the, you know, some of the, I remember like the video for, for one of the singles for Hardwired to Self-Destruct, but I had never even bothered listening to it because it was like, I, I never felt it. I probably should have listened to it before the episode just to give you a greater hint but i think for most of their albums that they've done since death magnetic from my from my impression is that they're just trying to recycle riffs i guess that's better than what they did on saint anger where they try to incorporate new metal into it which was a horrible album but uh metallica hasn't released anything like particularly good since the black album uh you know and the black album was a da was even a downgrade from their previous work so I, I don't really, I haven't bothered listening to the single. I can imagine what it sounds like. And at the end of the day, they're nearly 60. Like they're nearly 60. They're really old. Uh, I think even, you know, if it comes out in 2023, they're going to be, I think um, Hammett, I think Hammett Hetfield and Ulrich were all born in 63. So they're, they're going to be turning 60 next year. And the type of music they play is not the type of music that you, uh, you know, it's a little odd for people of that age to continue performing it. And it becomes at a certain time that you get too old to play metal. And that's kind of a reason why I'm a little, 
you know, hesitant to listen to it, but I probably should listen to it just for just for music sake listening so I can give you a better opinion about this. So maybe for next week, I'll give you an opinion on Hardwired to Self-Destruct and others. But Lulu, I tried to listen to and I was like, this is terrible. Came out in, uh, that came out in 2011. So that was the last new thing that I listened to at any extent besides Death Magnetic. So those are my opinions on that. Uh, will the new Metallica album be good? Um, probably not. I don't know. It might be listenable, but uh, at the end of the day, it's like six year old. It's six year old men trying to make thrash metal, and you know, it's a young man's genre, and it is what it is. They still make a ton of money, and they're still very successful for what they do. And I still love their old eighties records, but. You know, sometimes it's maybe just better to retire. <laughs> I, you know, I had a thought, I had a chance to even catch Iron Maiden live this year, but I was like hesitant to go see them. Uh, this is going into the age factors because they are all in like their mid 60s. And, you know, it's like an energetic music and it's like going around and you're seeing like a guy who's like 65, like, you know, jumping around and like moving around and trying to get the crowd pumped. And it's just not going to even with like Bruce Dickinson, you know, he's, you know, 60 now in his 60s. So it's like harder for him to hit those high notes that he could have done years ago. And even like Ozzy Osbourne, I know, had to be for a long time has to do um like uh, teleprompters <laughs> to help him like sing. And he's like terrible on stage. He's been terrible for a long time. So metal, it really, you only have a, a narrow time period to see a lot of these bands when they're still young. I think once they hit 50, it's, uh, you know, it's time to hang it up. But I mean, Metallica, they've kept in good shape because I mean, they're one of the premier bands in the world. So they've probably had a lot more access than other bands to maintain that they had the same physicality and, and were in good as shape to do that. But I remember um, another story. Uh, I know this is a digression, but Jason Newstead, who was their bassist, who le who played on um, Injustice for All, Black Album, the 90s records, but left before St. Anger. Uh, he... Uh, you know, he's been in various bands. He's probably been living off royalties from Metallica. You know, he's been a safe. Uh, he had a bunch of like side projects that were supposed to be big, but they never turned out that to be that big. Uh, but he was supposed to join. He was in talks to join Megadeth because Megadeth's old bass, pl uh, longtime bass player, uh, Dave Ellison, left over some hilarious um, like uh, <laughs> sex scandal or something where he's like hitting on a young fan or something. And maybe not so hilarious, but a little odd scandal. And they were like, we're going to bring back Jason Newstead. And Newstead, also close to 60. But the Newstead said that he's like, his family said like he can't, you know, tour because he's not in physical condition to tour anymore to play that type of music. You know, he's too old to do that. And so, you know, that's something. And I think Slayer retired because they were also too old. They're also the same age as Metallica. And, you know, Megadeth, I mean, Mustaine doesn't look too good either. You know, he is 60 now. And so it's, um, it's a little that, you know, it's something you see, you know, the truth, you know, people get old, they can't do everything forever. And, you know, age calls. And I think it is a little odd. I remember how odd it was. Uh, people talked about how odd it was when like the Rolling Stones would be touring in the 2000s. And at that, that time, they were in their 60s. And they're like, this is weird. I mean, but they kept, you know, one of the biggest rock bands, uh, you know, Mick Jagger was able to keep in very remarkably good health. Uh, even then, he's still in remarkably good health now. And they're in their 70s. And it was still very odd seeing this like old ass band play rock music. And people remarked about that. And now you're seeing the next generation uh hitting those same age gaps now and they're playing even more physical music and more youthful aggressive music and they're old men and it's an odd sight so they're not capable of performing and creating music like they once were so those are my thoughts on that uh long-winded way to end the discussion so that's it for today we're gonna have another incredible iq supplement later this week and another incredible Highly respected later this week. Maybe uh, one of these topics may be on Britain, uh, may be something else. So I'm trying to try to hold that for highly respected next week. If I'm not talking about that next week, it means that we had so much news to talk about that I couldn't get to it. 
So we'll talk about it at some point with this current state of Britain. So until next time, stay respected.